The strain is required to have the piezoelectric effect, and the strain can be uh, achieved by bending, or it can be achieved by stretching. I'm sorry, Professor Sushina, your time is two minutes left. Oh, okay. Thank you. Stretching or bending. So, it's difficult to make that under floor applications. So we come to a situation that we have try to uh, design a strain inducer and as first we have a bow spring and we have the PBDF spool, spool around the bow spring and if we apply a force then we have something like a stretching of the whole device. <coughs> Unfortunately, this one <coughs> is difficult in assembly. So we have developed a very simple device which is a hinge which is used in that case, and applying the force to the hinge leads to a stretching of the, of the PVDF, and it's a very simple assembly. And here you can see typical samples, and this is a, a sample as you can see it over here. It operates in that way, applying the force leads to a little bit to a stretching. This is a whole device. And then we have worked with such a device, sorry, <clears throat> and we had about four of these spools on the floor, and they deliver a voltage in a range of about peak-to-peak uh, <clears throat> uh, -peak voltage 200 volts, which is a lot of, and the energy of a cycle is in a range of about uh, 1.2 milliseconds the milliwatt seconds, which is a lot of energy. And uh, this is a power adjustment with a load <coughs> of about, I can say it, it's about seven mega ohms. And uh, then we have tested the environment with a Texas instrument <coughs> device. So we have a receiver, as you can see over here. The receiver is powered by an USB and the and the transmitter is powered by the energy harvester. This was positioned in the ground, and this was <coughs> deposited in, in the room. And after that, we have <coughs> measured the transmission, and you can see the voltage. <coughs> and it requires an energy of about 175 microwatt seconds. So it's much less than that what the energy harvester has produced. As you remember, if I'm going backwards, it has produced an energy, it's in a range of about 1,400 microwatt seconds at the power adjustment. And that's why this device operates very well. <coughs> so I can come to my conclusion. Different types of energy harvesters have been developed in the past. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all of them can't compete really with the power grid or batteries. <clears throat> in many cases, they are really complex and too expensive. Uh, under these circumstances, they can occupy, in best cases, niche only. <clears throat> Nevertheless, when we come to solutions which are driven by applications, and I think uh, some of the applications for energy harvesters have been shown, under these conditions, energy harvesters have a chance to get into the mass production market, especially if they are getting much cheaper as they are now. <coughs> uh, especially the Internet of Things, with an expected mass of sensors could be possible as a use of energy harvesters in such applications. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Strasinger, for uh, such interesting topic presentation. And now I open the session with Q and A session. Um, I will give three chances.
to us and don't forget to mention your name and where you come from. Any questions? One over there. And two. Maybe once more. Okay, we begin with the two uh, audience. Okay, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I want to ask about two questions. The first one, uh, the energy harvester will always not uh, stable in uh, resulting the, the, or triggering the power. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, the usage for sensor network is also not that uh, stable because sometimes to transmit, uh, we need uh, more power. Will the supercapacitor or the boost converter solve the problem? Uh, not really, not really. You need, you need uh, the stability is not from the energy harvester. The energy harvester is going to harvest energy and to store the energy if it's not required in uh, storage. And the storage can be a supercapacitor and it can be a battery as well. The only thing of the energy harvester is that you don't have to replace a battery or a supercapacitor. If it's discharged, uh, a capacitor you don't have to replace, but a battery you have to replace when it's discharged, you know? And if you have a supercapacitor or you have a battery as a storage, and you have the energy harvester which operates to feed the storage element, then you are in a stable condition. Sorry, for the second question, yeah. uh, will have uh, you already compare the uh, mechanical versus uh, uh, photovoltaic maybe? Yeah. Okay, um, photovoltaic is completely different to that because the energy density of photovoltaic cells is much higher than that of mechanical energy harvesters, unfortunately. Photovoltaic cells will not operate if it's dark. Yeah? Uh, so if you can make the same situation that you say, okay, I have a photovoltaic cell, it collects during the, the day. If it's uh, bright, you can collect something of energy, store it into a storage, and then if it's dark, you can uh, use this energy uh, for whatever it is. Nevertheless, <coughs> In some cases, you never have energy like light. So under these conditions, it's better to have a mechanical energy harvester as well. Is it okay? Thank you, Professor, for the interesting presentation. It's especially interesting for me because it's not something that I can see many times in Indonesia. So my question is, um, is there a need um, for uh, the energy harvester to not uh, disrupt the original use of the device it's attached to? For example, when you put it inside a pipe, uh, is there a need to not uh, this, uh, slows down the air or the water flow inside the pipe? Yeah. And under the floor, uh, is there a problem uh, if the floor is because of, of this harvester, the floor is shaky because you have to press down the floor and so on. And if yeah. so, uh, how do you solve that? Thank okay. You. Of course. Um, if you have an energy flow harvester or a harvester in, in pipe, uh, the plug body reduces slightly uh, the flow. Yes, of course. You are right. Uh, so no energy is coming from nothing. So if you want to have energy, you need to make some energy transfer. It's required. And the energy transfer is made by um, <coughs> some turbulences, or you call it vortex street. And the vortex street uh, will transfer the energy into electricity, or the, the flowing energy into electricity. This reduces a little bit uh, the flow rate. Nevertheless, you can make your plug body as small as possible. The only thing is, 
you need to generate some turbulences to get the spool or the harvester oscillating. Yeah? So it don't require that much of energy and we have made calculations. It's less than 1%, much more or less than 1% in losses you will have by a really good design flow uh, bluff body inside the pipe. Okay? Second, uh, you have asked for the floor energy harvesting. Yes, you have a moving up and down. This is similar to that, what they have in the dance floor applications or pet gen applications. They have a move up and down. This is depending on the, or what can I say, the stroke you are going to generate can be different. And if we have a hinge, as you have seen it, 